Uh, thank you, Mary. So uh, I'm going to try to keep this uh, brief so we have some time for questions. I'm going to be talking today about uh, an instrument that I've uh, developed to measure affective instability in borderline personality disorder. And my purpose today is uh, twofold. First of all, to see if I can give you a more um, comprehensive or different perspective on affective instability than some of those that have been presented so far at this conference. And second of all, to use um, affective instability or the measurements of affective instability as a means of differentiating um, BPD from bipolar disorder. Um, and uh, before we get started, I'd like to thank my uh, co-investigators here, uh, Mary Zanarini, uh, Chris Hopwood, uh, Catherine Thomas, and Garrett Fitzmaurice. So, uh, I th this is important because uh, affective instability, as you know, appears to be a core feature of uh, BPD, and I think it's also a core feature of bipolar disorder. Um, from my perspective, I think clinicians frequently misdiagnose um, BPD as bipolar disorder. Uh, in one study done by Mark Zimmerman's group, 24% uh, of the patients in his outpatient clinic um, met criteria for BPD, uh, not bipolar disorder. And uh, what I've seen is this misdiagnosis often leads to misprescription of treatment, which focuses too heavily on pharmacotherapy and not enough on the psychotherapies which have been demonstrated to be effective for BPD. So I'll just run through this very quickly. You know, uh, affective instability, as we know, is a, a core feature of uh, BPD in um, factor analyses. It has been shown to be one of the three latent factors uh, in the tripartite models uh, that are core for BPD. Um, some of you may not know that it appears that affective instability may also be a core feature of uh, bipolar disorder, even in the euthymic state. And there's one study by uh, Dr. Henri in um, Paris looking at uh, 179 uh, euthymic bipolar patients, 86 healthy controls, and she found that using the affective liability scale and affect intensity measure, um, that bipolar patients had significantly higher scores than healthy controls. So um, there's some controversy as to whether um, there's an overlap between BPD and bipolar disorder. Uh, there's one group of investigators uh, led by a Kiskel who would claim that actually BPD is part of a bipolar spectrum and that the affective instability in BPD is based on uh, or derives from a cyclothymic temperament. Uh, there's one study that his group did uh, looking at atypical depressives and found that those with cyclothymic temperaments had higher rates of BPD. Um, mood reactivity and interpersonal sensitivity, which are, as we know, are uh, borderline features. There's also another body of evidence, uh, some of which comes from our group in McLean, actually, that uh, supports the notion there's an overlap between BPD and bipolar disorder. And this is the mood stabilizing agents, uh, which are often used to treat bipolar disorder, may be useful in treating borderline personality disorder. Our group found, for example, that it's actually uh, lamotrigine was useful in treating affective instability in BPD. Um, but there's another school of uh, investigators uh, led by Dr. Paris here who would claim that actually there's um, no um, overlap between the two disorders, or very little overlap, um, that the mood instability in BPD and bipolar disorder uh, is actually defined differently. Also, if you look at uh, axis one comorbidity, with uh, borderline patients, you find that uh, bipolar disorder is actually not the most common comorbid diagnosis. You also, if you look at uh, axis two uh, comorbidity for bipolar patients, you find that BPD is no more common than other personality disorders. So let me introduce my instrument. It's called the ALQBPD, the Affective Liability Questionnaire for Borderline Personality Disorder. This is a self-report instrument. Uh, it covers the previous week. It contains 10 items. Uh, including nine items which measure different dimensions of affective instability. Each of those nine items measures both frequency and intensity. And uh, you can derive uh, subscales for overall frequency and overall intensity um, for um, affective instability, uh, pooling uh, results from the nine different dimensions. Um, and these are the, uh, the nine dimensions that are included. There are three which I'm going to call the more simple uh, affective shifts involving shifts from euthymia into more dysphoric emotions. And then there are um, six uh, 
affective shift dimensions, which are more complex, uh, involving shifts between dysphoric affects. And uh, this just shows how we rate frequency. It's a five-point Likert scale. Um, we tried not to make it too precise because I think retrospective recall just isn't that precise. And this is the way we have intensity coded. Um, again, it's, it's very crude, running from uh, one to four, slight to extreme. And then the tenth uh, question in the uh, questionnaire I included because I was curious about the extent to which uh, borderlines perceive their um, affective instability is reactive. So this question asks, asks, what percentage of time have changes in your mood occurred in reaction to the way someone treated you? So we uh, tested this uh, instrument with the help of Chris Hopwood on 818 undergraduates at a large university. Uh, the subjects completed multiple self-assessment instruments online, including, uh, for the purposes of this study, the PAI. Uh, the Xana reading rating scale for BPD, the self-report version, and the ALQ BPD. And uh, we classified subjects as bipolar if they had scores at least two standard deviations higher than the sample mean on the mania scale of the PAI. We classified subjects as borderline if they had scores at least two standard deviations higher than the sample mean on the borderline scale of the PAI. So to emphasize here, these are not subjects who've been diagnosed as having bipolar disorder or borderline personality disorder. One would say that they had elevated features of these disorders. Um, we excluded subjects who met criteria for BPD and bipolar disorder uh, simultaneously. So here are the results. We had uh, 21 subjects who uh, we classified as bipolar. That's 2.8% of the sample. 30 subjects. Uh, we classified as borderline, that's 4.1% of the sample, and we excluded two subjects because they met criteria for both. We had very limited demographics on the sample, but um, 13 bipolar subjects who were female, 24 borderline subjects were female. You can see the mean ages are approximately the same of the two groups. And uh, because this is a uh, previously untested instrument, we got some um, validity data on it, you can see that Kronbox alpha for frequency and intensity items was pretty high. And then to uh, examine convergent validity, we uh, correlated the total score for the nine items measuring different affective instability dimensions with the um, item on the Zan BPD self-report version that measures affective instability. And as you see, we found a very modest correlation. I think that's in part because the content of the item on the Zan BPD affective instability uh, that measures affective instability is, has more limited in content than the content of our questionnaire. And these are the results for the overall frequency scales. You can see there are really uh, quite significant differences between the two groups that the total frequency sale, uh, scale score for uh, BPD patients was about was over two times as high as the score for bipolar patients. Um, the score for severity uh, also differed quite significantly between the two groups being almost twice as high for the borderlines as opposed to the bipolars. And let's drill down and to look at uh, individual dimensions of affective instability. So you can see that all three of the more simple affective shifts were significantly more frequent uh, in the borderline group than the bipolar group with uh, shifts between euthymia and depression being the most common. Uh, reported by borderline patients uh, over once a day uh, and by bipolar patients uh, a little over once a week. And uh, also when you look at more complex mood shifts, you see that again there are quite significant differences. Uh, four out of the six uh, items um, it, it, that are more complex uh, showed there were significant differences and there was also a trend towards significance in a fifth item, that being uh, anger and anxiety. With intensity, the differences are not as marked. Uh, there are significant differences in the intensity when one shifts from euthymia into depression. Uh, borderline patients rated those shifts as uh, almost large, whereas bipolar patients rated them somewhere between uh, small and mild. And then uh, when it comes to more complex mood shifts, you can see that, um, whoops, ah. Let's 
So you can see that the, the only item which is significant here is this one for anxiety and depression, um, with borderline patients reporting that when they shifted it from anxiety to depression, their depression was uh, large. Now, I think the results of the last item are quite interesting. Um, you can see that there's a significant difference between the borderline and the bipolar groups that um, borderline patients reported that their uh, affective shifts were reactive to interpersonal events about 50% of the time. Uh, when it comes to the bipolar group, it was about uh, crudely, say, 22% of the time. But I think it's interesting that um, the, bo the borderline patients actually rated uh, their mood shifts as being not reactive about 50% of the time. So what can one conclude from this? Well, first of all, borderline patients had more frequent shifts in seven of the nine frequency dimensions on the instrument and on two of the nine uh, dimensions uh, measuring intensity. Also, when you look at the spread of values, uh, the frequencies of affective shifts in the different dimensions had wider, a wider spread for the BPD than the bipolar patients. Uh, they were mixed, they spread from somewhere between uh, once a week to two to three times a week uh, on the low end for the borderlines to uh, over once a day. Uh, with the bipolars, you can see the range is much smaller. Uh, they rated the frequency of their mood shifts somewhere between uh, less than, uh, than once a week to slightly over once a week. So it looks like, again, there's sort of more variability here. Also, again, I want to emphasize that if you look at the overall uh, scores for the subscales for um, intensity and frequency, you see there are significant differences. I want to uh, say a couple of words about the role of depressive affective shifts in this sample. Um, the most frequent uh, affective shifts for BPD and bipolar subjects were between euthymia and depression. Uh, borderline patients had more uh, frequent shifts, more frequent affective shifts in all three dimensions that involved depression. Uh, and the only two dimensions in which there were differences in intensity involved shifts into depression. So this surprised me because I would not have anticipated that uh, depression might have had that sort of centrality in the, the differences. I would have thought anger and anxiety would have been more prominent. So I'm not exactly sure what to make of this. Now in terms of interpersonal sensitivity, again, a borderline subjects reported affective instability that was more interpersonal than the bipolar subjects, uh, occurring uh, approximately 50% of the time, but that also means they thought their affective shifts were not interpersonal 50% of the time. So how do we explain this? Well, one possibility is that their mood shifts were not interpersonal, or at least, and perhaps not reactive. Another is that they just weren't able to make the connection between something that happened to them interpersonally and the shift. Hard to tell. So there, there are a number of limitations uh, to the study. First of all, it was based on self-report data. Also, as I said earlier, um, our definitions of BPD and bipolar disorder were based on a dimensional, not a categorical measure. It was a fairly small sample size. We didn't get any information on different types of bipolar disorder. Traditionally, type 2 bipolar disorder has been considered, uh, considered to be much closer to BPD than type 1. I think it's uh, both the strength and the weakness of this instrument that it's a state, not a, uh, a trait measure. Also, we didn't have any information on other factors that might affect affective instability, such as comorbid axis one conditions, medication status, severity of illness, and we didn't have any information on mood state at the time uh, of assessment, which may have influenced reporting. So what are the implications? Well, First of all, I would say that affective instability in BPD and bipolar disorder appears to have different profiles based on this data. This supports earlier work that I've done in this area. Um, and it also suggests that clinicians should ask in detail about affective instability as a means of differentiating the two disorders and informing treatment more precisely. It also suggests that depression may be an essential component of the affective instability in BPD. And finally, uh, although affective instability in BPD appears to be more reactive, than affective instability in bipolar disorder, it may actually have uh, a substantial endogenous component. Um, and let me just put my uh, hat as a clinician on for a second and say I think this is an enormously complicated area. Uh, I've become uh, more interested in treating uh, bipolar patients over the last few years, and I'm impressed by how many bipolar patients seem to have a lot of borderline features. 
So what I would say is actually the opposite of what uh, Kiskel would uh, propose, which is that there are a lot of borderlines who really don't have many bipolar features, and they don't look um, bipolar at all. But particularly the, the bipolars who have a lot more mood instability do seem to act a lot more like borderlines. So uh, why don't I stop there and take any questions? Good question. I'm having difficulty hearing you. Uh, no, it's not on. Okay. I would wonder if patients who had the mood changes without interpersonal events, if it might be that the event was moving from a situation where they were with another person to spending some time alone. Yes, no, I, I agree. I mean, I think that there, there are limitations in the way that we assess that. This may be no different from what you were raising, but it seems like I have a lot of clients now who have rapid cycling bipolar. And to me, I question what that really means, and it sounds mm -hmm. like it really looks more like borderline personality disorder. Uh, yeah, I mean, when I uh, see someone who's diagnosed as being rapid cycling or cyclothymic, I'm immediately suspicious that it's BPD. Yes, Valerie. Uh, it may and may not. That's been my experience. Yeah, I, I think a lot of the, the, the sicker borderlines that I've seen, um, they'll tell you they have mood changes and they don't necessarily seem to be in, in reaction to anything. They sort of may wake up in a particular mood state. Um, so, I mean, I, my own belief is that there is at least some slight endogenous component so, to their mood instability. All right, thank you.